Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser here at the Hauser Neck Center in Fort Myers, Florida. One of the mysteries, and people often ask this, so that's why I want to do a video on it, is, you know, how could my problem that I'm suffering from, like my stomach isn't working or I have headaches and I don't have any neck pain, so how could it be from the neck? Because if you think about it, if I said, what's the number one reason why people don't get diagnosed, that they have a heart problem, a lung problem, an eye condition, a brain condition, like they have brain fog, or horrible body fatigue, or tachycardia, and the doctors aren't diagnosing it as a neck problem, is probably because the person doesn't have a lot of neck pain. Right, so anybody who has neck pain and then they have my heart skipping beats or whatever, the doctor might think, you know, maybe it's from the neck. But when you don't have neck pain and you have like head pressure, the doctor is not gonna think about that it's actually the neck. So I just wanted to go through how could this be? You know, how could this be? Now, when you do get ligament injury in the neck, basically what happens is the muscles will tighten. So what can happen is the muscles can stiffen up or tighten where the ligaments aren't stretched excessively because that's basically what causes pain. Like if you want to know, the primary cause of neck pain is going to be the stretching of the ligaments in the neck. But because many people's neck structure slowly changes over time because of you know, hours and hours on the computer, what can happen is the muscles get so tight around the neck that they limit the motion of the neck enough where the nerve endings and the ligaments don't get stretched so they don't have neck pain. But because of the abnormal neck structure, which I call cervical destructure, a breakdown of the neck curve, then it can affect the carotid artery, the jugular vein or vagus nerves, then you get systemic symptoms but not neck pain. So basically a person can have a malrotation of a vertebrae and that's causing uh, symptoms and them not have pain or they can have severe compression or kinging of a blood vessel, vagus nerve degeneration and end up having a lot of systemic symptoms but not have any neck pain. So these are the three mechanisms, primarily how you can have systemic symptoms but not have any neck pain. So if we look at this, if a person has compression of the jugular vein, the jugular vein goes through the jugular foramen. Also what goes through that hole is the glossopharyngeal nerve, spinal accessory nerve, vagus nerve. So in other words, if somebody had a malrotation of the atlas, right, they could have compression of all those structures or because of a forward head posture, again, the atlas could go forward and then that could cause compression of the jugular vein. When you get compression of the jugular vein, you're gonna end up having head pressure and your, the brain's not gonna work right and a person could uh, not be able to problem solve as good they almost feel like their memory's going. They have terrible brain fog. Now, the same thing can occur with changes in the neck structure where you get where the artery, where one of the arteries gets affected. In this model, you can see that there, you can see the vertebral artery. So see the red there. The vertebral arteries, they form the basilar artery and the basilar artery and its branches that supplies all the blood to this part of the brain. So anybody who turns their head and all of a sudden they get really dizzy or they get vertigo, or they, I'll have patients tell me, I'm just telling you doc, when I have my episodes, it feels like I'm gonna die. Like a lot of times, and their heart boom, 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 and they gotta lay down and they feel like they're gonna die. They might get acute nausea, they get vertigo, horrible dizziness that normally is that a blood vessel is getting compressed. So again, that is relates to the neck, the blood vessels getting uh, compressed in the neck. And the way a person diagnoses that, or at least how we do it is, 
It's called the transcranial Doppler exam. We have the person wear this device, we call it the Frankenstein device. But basically the ultrasound probes are measuring the blood flow in the brain and then we're having them hold a position. And then basically you see that there's major changes in the blood flow based on instability and different problems in their neck. And again, we can do the same thing, uh, not just in the vertebral arteries, but there's arteries in the front of the neck called the carotid arteries. Those are basically the main arteries. They supply you know, 70% of the blood flow to the brain, but mostly the front part. And we can measure the blood flow in those arteries while moving the neck. And we could see that there's compression the other way you can get systemic symptoms is when there's obstruction of the cerebral spinal fluid. So especially if somebody has a lot of arthritis, right? We know as the, the degenerative process goes on, the body stabilizes the joints by overgrowing bone and the overgrowth of bone is called arthritis. Well, eventually the arthritis can narrow the spinal canal and then especially if you have a little bit of instability too, it can block cerebral spinal fluid flow. That can increase um, the brain pressure and give you head pressure and all the different things that happen with the internal jugular vein being compressed. And what I call that is the clogged brain toilet. Basically when the brain can't drain or the fluid flow in the brain is slowed, which can be any obstruction of the cerebral spinal fluid. See, this is cerebral spinal fluid. It surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. In this example, the jugular vein is getting compressed and then you get increased cerebral spinal fluid here in the frontal area of the brain. So the frontal lobe, as we all know, is involved in detailed problem solving, focusing. It's kind of like what makes you human. So what makes you human is you're supposed to try to do the right thing, things that help other people, kind things, loving things. So this part of the brain also inhibits bad behavior, if it will. When you get a lot of cerebral spinal fluid accumulating here, it can put pressure on the frontal lobe and then the person starts having anxiety. They can have difficulty working. Like a task that would normally take them two minutes can take 10 minutes. And frustration becomes the norm. Anxiety becomes the norm. You can even get rage. And of course you get unbelievable brain uh, fog, brain fatigue. So when you have blockage of CSF or you get blockage of the internal jugular vein, you can get all these symptoms, dizziness, anxiety. Visual snow is when a person's looking and it looks like there's all kinds of snow. That occurs because cerebral spinal fluid accumulates around the eye nerves. So the electrical impulse uh, is getting distorted. So it's a distorted electrical impulse from the back of the eye, which is the retina to the occipital lobe. Under ultrasound, we look at the optic nerve and when there's a lot of fluid around the optic nerve, electrical impulse can get distorted. And when it's distorted, it's similar to recently we had Comcast line under the ground was damaged. So my parents who uh, in their room, when they were visiting over the winter, they would have a normal uh, TV picture then, you know, in two minutes later it would be all distorted, like snowy. So the same thing happens in the eye. Distorted vision after images also occur because cerebral spinal fluid uh, goes around the eye nerve. So I had a patient yesterday where the eye nerve on the left, the diameter of the optic nerve sheet diameter was 9.5 on one eye and the other eye was 6.8. So this person had unbelievable amounts of visual symptoms. So the image was the image from the eye to the brain on one side was getting there quicker and the other side was getting there much slower. One of the eye nerves had so much fluid around it that the image was getting slow to the brain on that side. So they would see many different images. 
So after image just means you see me, then I go away and then you still see the image of me. That's an after image. That particular patient actually had seasickness feeling too. They always felt like they were on a boat. You could just tell the way they looked at things. It's just like they don't have a stable uh, gaze. The gaze is unstable, meaning that they're looking at something and the brain because there's two or, two or three different images that the brain's getting when they're looking at something, it's like being on a boat. Like you and I can look at something and we get three dimensional image of it because the, the image on this side and this side are getting to the brain at the same time. So if that image gets, like say, because there's a block, if you will, in the eye nerve, there's a block because there's so much fluid they might get two or three images from this eye at one time and two or three images of this one, but it occurs later. And then the brain, what's the brain going to do with that? Like it's trying to make sense of what the image is. So you just get this queasy feeling. So that's just called an unstable visual field. And of course, when there's high brain pressure, the brain just doesn't function right. And you have all kinds of personality problems. You can get depersonalization, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, panic attacks, uh, all kinds of things, brain fog, focusing issues. And then of course, if there's too much pressure on the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland, you get all kinds of hormone issues. So if your hormones are out of whack and they can't figure out why, it could be that you have high brain pressure. Now, the treatment of that is, of course, restoration of the cervical curve, treatment of the misalignments, and if instability is present, then prolotherapy. And once the jugular vein flow gets restored, once the cerebral spinal fluid gets restored. We, I didn't even talk about the vagus nerve, but the vagus nerve also, if that gets damaged, that can cause all kinds of upset stomach, digestive tract, tachycardia. So if the vagus nerve gets regenerated or the impulses get through more, all those symptoms like the stomach starts working right, digestion's better, the heart starts functioning better because the electrical impulses to it are restored then obviously um, the person feels much, much better.